There's a lot of things I don't know the answer to on why. I don't know why glue doesn't stick to the inside of a bottle. You ever figure that out? Um, I don't understand uh, why women can't put mascara on without opening their mouth. I don't understand a lot of things. But one of the more troubling things I don't understand is why I find it so hard to forgive and let go when someone hurts me and offends me. I don't know why that's so hard, but I've got to make a confession to you. It is, it is, I find it difficult. I've been on both sides of that. And sometimes it absolutely seems impossible I know what it's like to hurt someone that I never intended to hurt deeply and wish like everything I could undo it and plead for forgiveness only to be told, no, I couldn't be forgiven. That's a hopeless feeling. I also know what it's like to be hurt and be devastated deeply by someone and then just have such unforgiveness in my own heart forgetting how it felt when I couldn't be forgiven now I won't forgive this other person because they did me really bad they really hurt me and so I hold on to it and I I feel um, this bitterness and this resentment and someone asked me about it I'm quick to tell them and I can recount every little detail if only we had a product that could get rid of that. Well, I just happened to have found one. I was uh, Googling, oh, it's been a couple of years ago, uh, the, the subject of forgiveness. I hope you're still out there. I can't see you. Um, but Googling forgiveness, and up came this product of essential oil called forgiveness. You know, this isn't actually it. This is my hand sanitizer, but I made it look like something special. And um, actually, the bottle you'd get is a little smaller. And on the product list, in the, on the online advertisement, it said, um, this product here, you just apply it, a certain amount of it, and it will give you um, soothing, uplifting feelings. It will uh, release negative memories. It will move beyond emotional barriers and give you the ability to forgive and let go. All natural. Now, I don't know about you, but the stuff, I find it, hard to forgive sometimes, I would need more than this to make it work. I would need like a whole bathtub full of uh, something like this to make it work. And you know, I got in trouble one time using this example because there was a person in the audience that actually sold this stuff. She was not a happy camper with me. And I'm just like, hey, I don't want to hurt your business, but can we talk? Really? I mean, really, essential oil? I mean, just a little dab will do you, and voila, you forgive? I mean, I don't want to make light of your hurt and your unforgiveness this morning, but I want to tell you, baby, that's not going to do it. Not at all. Not even going to come close. Don't you wish it was that easy, though? I mean, if it was that easy this morning, I'd open it up and just have you come through in a line, just squirt on, you know, everybody, and we'd be good, good for the holidays. How many's got family gatherings coming up in the holidays? How many of you got somebody in your family that's that extra grace-required person? How many of you got some people that'll show up at some gathering over the next 30 days in your family gatherings that you can still remember what they did and how long it took and what, they, what it costs? And, you know, I mean, you got that family member? I'm, I'm sure you don't, but I'm sure the, there's Baptist communities in town that do. So um, of all the fears that we've talked about in this series, this one may be a little different. The fear of letting go and totally forgiving someone else. C.S. Lewis, philosopher, once said, forgiveness is a beautiful word. I mean, we love to hear that word forgiveness. He said, forgiveness is a beautiful word until you have something to forgive. I mean, that's like I would be a great father if it weren't for my kids. You know how that goes? You'd be a great mom and housewife if it wasn't for the kids and the housework, right? Uh, we think forgiveness is a beautiful word until we get hurt. And when I'm hurt and offended, even though I know a lot about the idea of forgiveness, and you do too, and everybody on the street, like was interviewed in the video, has an idea about forgiveness, my first reaction isn't typically to let it go. Rather, my first reaction is about how to even the score. 
at least letting as many other people know as I can about how I've been hurt. In fact, our entertainment media is just uh, saturated with examples of people wanting revenge. I understand there's a whole TV series that's been on for like, I don't know how long, that's, uh, the whole title is Revenge. And the whole movie's about getting revenge. And I mean, you think about that. And I know, I get it, I get it. Probably wouldn't, you know, make the cut if you did a series on forgiving others. But at any rate, although I don't have any kids in the house, I've heard there's this movie called Frozen. If you're a parent, I bet you know about it. And if you're a parent, you're probably very familiar with the song, Let It Go. You know, I don't even know how it goes, but I've uh, heard it. But the lyrics kind of intrigued me, and I don't even know the context of it. But it says, the, the opening lyric says, The snow glows white on the mountain tonight, not a footprint to be seen. Here's the line that caught me. A kingdom of isolation, and it looks like I'm the queen. And I'll tell you what, what I thought about was when I, what I do know is that when I let fear, the fear of forgiving someone else that hurt me, when I let the fear of letting them go dominate my heart, I will live in relational emotional and spiritual isolation and the only answer to get out of that isolation is learning to let it go and forgive king louis the 12th of france said this he said nothing smells so sweet as the dead body of your enemy that's a crummy way to look at things but there's a chinese proverb that says the man who opts for revenge should dig two graves that's very very true where the fear of letting go comes in is our notion of justice and payback. You see, here, here's how I'm wired. I'm sure you're not quite this extreme, but if I let it go and I let them go, they won't have to pay, and they need to pay. If I, don't let, it, if I let it go, who's going to see it through to the end? I'm not sure if you remember the Old Testament story about Jonah. Remember the... Well, swallowing the guy, if you don't remember anything else, you probably remember that. Well, the whole thing started where God told him to go to his enemies and tell them about God's love and his judgment and give them an opportunity to repent or they were going to face his judgment. And he didn't want to go because he knew God was also a gracious God. So he ran the other way. And, of course, you may be familiar with the story. He got on a boat and got caught in the storm. They threw him overboard. Storm ended. Fish swallowed him. Spit him up on dry land. He kind of had a wake-up call. And God said, okay, the plan's still the same. Go do what I told you to do in the beginning. That's kind of the way God works. And so he did. He went and he preached to these people, and he didn't even like them, but he told them about God's forgiveness and God's judgment if they didn't, you know, ask for forgiveness and all this. And you know what they did? Unbelievable. They, they listened, and they all repented. And they said, oh, my goodness, we need to change our ways. And guess what Jonah did? He got mad. He got mad at God, and he went and sat down, and he pouted, and God had a conversation with him, and he was like, see, I knew if I obeyed you, and I let it go, you would let him off the hook. Now, you know the story of that? You can hear, you know, whether you believe a fish swallowed a guy, and he survived it, and all this kind of stuff. That, to me, that's not the main point. The main point is, is how much of Jonah is in each of us, where we don't want God to let somebody off the hook, because we don't want to let him off the hook. That's often what happens when we're living with unforgiveness. Don't we, um, we feel convicted sometimes as Christians, we'll feel convicted by God about our unforgiveness. And if we know anything about God's mercy and grace, we know deep down inside that um, we're supposed to forgive. And so we don't want to hear that because we need to still get our pound of flesh or our satisfaction. Do you remember about 10 years ago, the mass killing in the Amish community up in the Northeast. Um, the gunman went into a schoolhouse and just tragically slaughtered some little girls. It, it just shook. It shook the nation. And um, our country was left speechless first by the brutality of that attack. But it was then immediately stunned by the response of the Amish community. Do you, I don't know if you recall that. The national media was stunned. They didn't even really know how to handle it the, uh, because the, the Amish community only talked about the shootings in terms of forgiveness. Now, I mean, 
any other context, people hear the word Amish, see an Amish community or an Amish person, and they kind of smirk. And yet, we weren't smirking then because something so tragic had happened, so unfair, and they would only talk about it in terms of forgiveness. And get this, they even welcomed the shooter's wife to attend the funeral of the girls. Holy smokes. That, that just rocked me when I remember seeing that. One ABC reporter said, such are the minds of the forgiving. Passages from the New Testament are taken literally in this community, and the Amish believe they need to love their enemies, which may be beyond the ability of most people. And that's probably true. It is true without God's grace. I don't know about you, but most of my offenses I get troubled over and the, the grievances I don't want to forgive far on a far lesser end of severity than what happened in that Amish community. I realize you may be among those here today that uh, you know, you're just buried with a burden of physical or emotional or sexual or mental abuse and from someone that you trusted or perhaps someone you loved was taken from you because of someone else's rage or someone else's neglect. But here's what I would like to share with you today. There's no, I would never diminish or limit or de, uh, lessen, try to lessen your pain and what you're feeling, but I would plead with you to understand that to stay imprisoned by unforgiveness will cost you more than you'll ever realize. It'll cost you your soul. You know, one time there was a precocious teenager. Any of you ever been a precocious teenager? How many of you knew one? Okay, that's a little safer. But uh, his siblings kind of got enough of him one day. And um, he was the youngest and kind of babied. And he was a little bit, you know, he just didn't have a filter. They ran things through. And they had enough. They took him on a field trip, camping trip, sold him to uh, some slave traders. And he ended up in a foreign country. And you may think, oh, that sounds kind of like something in the Bible. Well, it is. And it's, his name is Joseph. They sold him to Egypt, and he gets there, and then uh, he gets a little break, and then somebody falsely accuses him, and then he gets thrown in prison, and he's in prison. And, you know, things just go from bad to worse. And then uh, he helps one of his in fellow inmates get out of jail, and the guy totally forgets about him. And everything he tries to do good seems like it turns reverse against him. But one day, something changed. He got his break, and he overcame... Uh, all those negative things, and he rose to a great position of power in a very powerful government, if you recall the story. And here was the sweet part. Man, there's some great stories of tension and re resolution in the Bible. Suddenly, his siblings had to come to him for their very livelihood and sustenance. Put yourself in Joseph's place. Would that be sweet or what? That the people that had stole your... your adolescence, stole your life, and they have to now come to you and ask for just the basic necessities. How sweet would that be? Well, the scripture says that one day the father of this whole group died. Well, then the brothers were afraid now that the father's dead, maybe the revenge is going to come now. So here's what it says in scripture. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that we did to him. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him and said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, and here's a great line for us to remember, don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? Isn't that, isn't that what keeps me from letting go? Isn't that what keeps you from letting go to that person that hurt you or betrayed you and caused you grief? I want to reserve the right for judgment and punishment, don't you? And when Joseph finally came to the place of forgiving his brothers, the hurt did not disappear. Just like when you decide to forgive someone, it doesn't mean the hurt's going to disappear. But here's what will happen. The burden of being their judge will begin to go away. And I want to tell you, the burden, uh, carrying the burden of being someone else's judge is heavy duty. That's why I'm not God and you're not God. We can't handle the burden of playing God. So wrong does not disappear when you 
forgiven offender, it loses its grip on you, and then it's taken over by God. He knows exactly what to do. It's a decision that involves a lot of risk, the risk that God may not deal with the person as you want them to, just like Jonah struggled with. One would think that Christians would be the most forgiving people on the planet, but I've found, and I don't know about you, have anybody here ever found that Christians sometimes aren't too forgiving? Oh, shocking, isn't it? I don't know how people without an understanding of God's grace and forgiveness can hope to overcome bitterness. I, I suppose they do. But here's what I'm finding to be true. Only the forgiven can truly forgive. Only the forgiven can truly forgive. You see, God didn't send Jesus to die for my sins because my sins were not as bad as yours. He didn't send Jesus to die for my sins because I was really a good guy and really didn't need it, but he had to do it for everybody. Forgiveness will be difficult if I don't grasp how God has forgiven me, and it will be for you as well. Look at the scripture in um, Paul wrote. He said, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. If only by, it is only by grace that you've been saved. Now, uh, do a little inventory with me, okay? Um, you up for that? I won't ask you to come down front. I'm not going to come ask you to say something over a microphone. I'm not going to ask you to sing a song. Nothing like that. Here, here's the, but I need your involvement. Okay? Um, how many times a day do you think you might sin? Hmm, some of you are getting out your calculator. Well, um, how many times a day do you think that you might sin? Okay, a fairly good person, I mean, when I say sin, I'm talking about, well, maybe you had a lustful thought. Didn't act on it, but you had a lustful thought. And Jesus did say, it's the same thing as, I mean, if you commit it in your heart, you know, that's kind of a sin. And, or act selfishly. Any of you ever act selfishly? You're having a selfish moment. Neglect to show compassion to someone in your path when you could do it. Shade the truth, pad an expense account, anything like that. A fairly good person, I read one time, will sin maybe 30 to 40 times a day. And I don't know who makes up these statistics, but just kind of go with me on it, all right? A good person may do 30 or 40 times a day. And a saint, maybe 10 times a day. But just for the sake of our understanding, let's just say everybody in this room today is a super saint. Okay? How many would you like to be a super saint? This may be your only opportunity to be a super saint. So a super saint, let's say only sins three times a day, three times a day, a super saint, all of us. Okay, that's really good. Like only three times a day you have a hateful thought or you gossip or you neglect to do what is right or any way disobey God in any way. Now here's the question. First of all, if you do three times a day, that's 1,095 times a year. Just do the math with me. You can write it down if you want. 1,095 times a year, and if you live to be 70, that's 76,000 sins. Now, that's a fair amount. And here's the question. It would be worth writing down, if you, not to forget it. How do I want God to handle my 76,000 sins? How do I want him to handle my 76,000 sins of Super Saint Phil. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure mine, if I live to 70, will be more than 76,000. Because I don't know that I make it out three a day. Here's the deal. God said in his word, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And here are three important words. Just as God, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Just as God. I'm supposed to treat my offender just the way God treats me as I offend him. I realize you're not God and you realize I'm not God. So, it's, you know, we're not going to be perfect. 
But does your, def- does your offender deserve to be, for you to forgive them? In fact, do they even realize that you're offended and that you're withholding forgiveness? Sometimes that, that they don't even know. Have they ever apologized or lived out probation in regards to the offense that they committed against you? Probably not. Doesn't it seem like justice will not be served if we, and we wouldn't be vindicated if we follow Jesus' example and forgive no strings attached? It does to me. But that is what total forgiveness is, and that's what total forgiveness does. Perhaps the reason we fear letting offenders go is because we misunderstand forgiveness. That what forgiveness means it does not mean being a doormat. It doesn't mean ignoring justice. It doesn't mean uh, that you have to forget what was done. That's not even in the Bible to forget it. it how, how can you forget it? It doesn't mean that you have to have warm feelings and spend your vacations with them again. It doesn't mean that you have to be in fellowship with them. It doesn't mean you have to even trust them again. It doesn't condone what they did. It doesn't excuse what they did. But forgiveness is all about a choice, and it's all about grace. And you know what grace is? You have offended God. I have offended God when we sin. We've all done that. The Scripture bears that out. We know that. How many of you have ever let yourself down? Let me see your hand. Anybody other than me? Boy, there's some of you that are really in good shape. Um, You know, think about it. I've let myself down. I know I've let God down at some point in time. Forgiveness is an intentional decision to give something good to someone who doesn't deserve it. To give something good to someone who doesn't deserve it. Isn't that what God does for you and me? Total forgiveness is about a choice. We can't feel our way into an action. Well, I don't feel like forgiving them. They hurt me. You'll never feel like it. But you can't feel your way into an action, but you can act your way into the right decision, and that will bring the right feelings. When we do what God says and choose his way, is there an offense or hurt that you didn't ask for in your life that, you have, uh, that has you stuck and in, in in a prison with unforgiveness? It doesn't matter if your offender deserves or even asks for forgiveness. You're the one who isn't free. So how can I totally forgive? And there's a book, uh, I only think we have one or two in the, at the Resource Center, but this book was given to me by one of my closest friends when I was struggling with not forgiving someone. And it's a book called Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. You can get it on Amazon or whatever. But here's how we totally forgive. And this book, this is some of what was in the book. I have to totally agree with God. I must decide to totally agree with God. Now, we talk about confession, and what confession means is agreeing with God. Agreeing that God, to, with God that what we did was wrong. Agreeing with God that, you know, this was sin. Agreeing with God that we need forgiveness. Agreeing with God that there's a better way. Agreeing that I'm bitter and that that's not a good place to be. Agree that God's way is the best way. A lot of it's been written, even by non-Christians, about the benefits of forgiveness. A a USA Today article talked about the mounting evidence of emotional and physical health payoffs from the act of forgiveness. One study showed that those who participated in the study had less stress, less anger and psychosomatic symptoms, less headaches, um, stomach upsets, less ulcers. And another study showed those that forgave had increasing feelings of love and trust, decreased depression, grief, and vulnerability to substance abuse. That's people that have found that to be true that not necessarily follow Christ. So we need to totally agree with God. And secondly, you need to pray honestly and regularly about it. Uh, pray honestly and regularly about it. Remember the Lord's Prayer, the lines in the Lord's Prayer, give us today uh, the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. We often stop there, but then there's another verse in Luke, uh, Matthew 6, 14. It says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. There's that comparison again, to forgive as Christ, as God forgave us through Jesus Christ. To forgive as God forgave us. Let me ask you, do you have a, would you say you have a Velcro heart or a Teflon heart? I mean, you know the difference, right? I mean, Velcro, that sticky stuff. When we were trying to teach my son to play baseball, we had a cheat glove that you had a Velcro ball, 
and you had a glove that had a patch of Velcro in it. So all you had to do was hit that spot. He didn't even have to catch it. You ever, you ever see those? Maybe it was a short-lived item. But it just, everything sticks to Velcro. But thank God for Teflon, it, stuff just slides right off, like when you're cleaning dishes. And I think sometimes our hearts are either Velcro, everything sticks to us, the, the offenses, or a Teflon heart that we're able to just let it go. And here's what I'm finding out, is that it's hardly ever a one-and-done deal. It's hardly ever like, okay, I forgive you, I go on about my way, because then something will happen, and I'll see that, oh, you are going about your merry way, and something good happens to you, and then I go, well, that stinks. They don't even feel any consequences for what they did. We don't know that, but we assume that. By praying and remembering our own needs of forgiveness regularly, we can keep our hearts coated in Teflon or God's Spirit. And so we pray regularly through it. And because you have those uh, negative thoughts that come back up after you think you've forgiven them, don't, don't let that mess you up. Just realize it's going to be a process. And the more that you come to God and you thank him for his forgiveness and the more you tell him, God, I need your help to forgive, humble yourself and say, God, I can't forgive them in my own power, but I can through your power because after all, you have forgiven me of so much, at least 76,000 sins if I live to be 70. So what is the proof if we've totally forgiven? Now here's the deal. Some people go, well, I'm supposed to forgive and forget even though the Bible doesn't say that, and yet I still can't forget. Well, here's the deal. You probably won't forget. But here's what will happen is if you process this realizing God's grace can help you and realize how much God's forgiven you, and you pray about it and you be honest with God, you can get to the point where you, you won't forget that that thing happened, but its effect on you will no longer cause you pain and hold you captive and isolate you in your kingdom of isolation. So what's the proof of total forgiveness? Here it is. The ultimate proof of total forgiveness takes place when I sincerely ask God to let those who hurt me off the hook. Ask God to let them off the hook I must set them free as if they did nothing wrong. I need to forgive as I want God to forgive me. I must ask God to see them as if they hadn't done anything wrong. And then I need to take it a step further. And, okay, this is going to be really hard for you, but it was for me. I need to pray that God bless and prosper them as he sees fit. Now, let me ask you a personal question because that's hard to process. I mean, like, okay, Phil, you're talking about forgiving them, letting them off the hook, but now I've got to pray that God bless and prosper them? Can we just be real honest with each other here? How many of you have ever sinned against God, and you ask him to forgive you, and you are confident he forgave you? Anybody other than me here today, just raise your hand high. Everybody participate. How many of you have been forgiven by God? Yeah? When he forgave you, are you hoping he totally forgave you? Or that it was provisional? How many of you, after you've been forgiven by God, have even asked God to bless and prosper you? How many of you have experienced God's blessing and prospering in your life after you've offended him and sinned and asked forgiveness. He, if he didn't, we would all be in a mess, wouldn't we? And so if we're going to forgive as God forgave us, we need to let people off the hook and pray that God will bless them. And I, I tell you what, I struggled with this one. I struggled with it. I struggled with it. I'm like, you know, they don't deserve it. They, they need to pay. People have to know. Uh, they need to... Uh, experience some of what I've experienced and then I have to go back and think okay I come to God and I'm comforted that he's forgiven me and he doesn't keep bringing it up to me and I'm relieved that he lets it go and he doesn't make me wear a label the rest of my life as damaged goods and that's what it means to forgive as God in Christ forgave us 
What if God forgave me and blessed me in direct proportion of how I forgive others and pray that God would bless them? There was a movie a few years ago, and I'll wrap it up with this, um, called The Interpreter. And there's a character that was played by Nicole Kidman. And she was an interpreter at the United Nations. And she was a, there was a security threat against a, an African leader who had been responsible for her parents' death. And so there was some speculation that maybe she was going to be behind an assassination attempt. And so when she was confronted about it, she began to tell about this tribe in Africa and how their custom is with forgiveness. And she said, everyone loses somebody, somebody, everyone who loses somebody wants revenge on someone. On God, if they can't find anyone else. But in Africa, at this, in this one tribe, they believe that the only way to end grief is to save a life. If someone is murdered, a year of mourning ends with a ritual that we call the drowning man trial. There's an all-night party beside the river. At dawn, the killer is put in a boat. He's taken out in the water and he's dropped. He's bound so he cannot swim. The family of the dead then have to make a choice. They can let him drown or they can swim out and save him. And this particular tribe believes that if the family lets the killer drown, they'll have justice, but they'll spend the rest of their life in mourning. But if they save him, if they admit that life isn't always just, that very act take, can take away their sorrow. And then she says, vengeance is a lazy form of grief. Wow. That's pretty powerful. Basically, when we overcome the fear of letting go and we let someone off the hook who has hurt us, we're freeing ourselves from our kingdom of isolation. We're giving a gift of grace, whether they realize it or not, whether they ever feel the effect of it or not, whether the other person ever feels grateful that you let them off the hook. But you will feel an immense release once you let it go and say, you know what, I'm not God. I can't manage being the judge. I can't handle the pressure of this. I'm not handling it well. I want to be free. And you just humble yourself before God and ask him to help you to forgive as he's forgiven you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, this is a, wow, big, deep subject for a short time here this morning. And the spectrum is wide in this audience today of those who have been hurt or offended or done wrong. And also the spectrum is wide of those here today that know they've done wrong and they've offended and they've hurt. And they so long to be forgiven. We can't control that and we're so grateful that you can forgive us when others don't. But for a the rest of us who are holding on to a grievance, to a grudge, to a hurt. We don't want to be prisoners in our kingdom of isolation. We want to be able to forgive like you forgave us in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray right now in this room that you would give grace to the man or woman who's struggling right now today with this whole issue. And let them see that sometimes, and most of the time, the person that forgives is the one that feels the greatest healing. And they find that they set a prisoner free and find that it's themselves. I pray if there's someone today that is holding back that forgiveness to someone who needs it so desperately, that they would be like the tribe in Africa that they swim out to that drowning man and they save him, whether they think they deserve it or not. Because that's what you did for us when you sent Jesus to earth. Thank you for your grace today. Amen.